Cool. So hi, everyone. This is Christina. And for those of you who doesn't know me, I don't have an introductory spell of myself because um, you can always find me up in Google. I am a technical evangelist. Now I'm moving on to a role as a portfolio architect, which I talk about all everything about Red Hat technology. So this is one of the projects I did in April. So I'm very happy to share that with you. And I would love to hear your feedback on what you think about in this topic. But this is strictly what I think. And this is what I uh, want to this is how I put together all Red Hat technology and create an event mesh in a multi-cloud world. So everything will be around um, in the multi-cloud topics and uh, how to build event mesh using CamelK and then also trying to make it serverless. Well, so I want to start by uh, introducing the, the the whole idea why I came up with this topic. Well, I was doing some research with our customer. Of course, I talk to customer all the time. And uh, one of the so one of our, my colleagues that went off and did a quick survey on most of our customers. So this is kind of what the industry trend is today, where most of 90 percent of the enterprise and companies are now uh, going towards this um, cloud native journey where everybody's trying to put their uh, applications, their service, their workload on top of the cloud, right? So this so this trend of going onto the cloud is inevitable, right? So everybody's going on there, of course. Um, but when you think about going on the cloud, there's so many different meanings on going to the clouds. Um, there could be just doing a quick lift and shift where people have their own large applications, where, when, where I'm talking about more of the applications, they're just doing a lift and shift and then putting that onto a cloud environment or they're doing some migrations or some of them like, uh, so, or just doing some kind of um, infrastructure purchase on the cloud where they're still um, developing their workload and everything like that. But there's another genre of people they were saying they're on the cloud, but they were using SaaS applications. They're, they're purchasing those pre-built service from the, the vendors um, and then integrating with what they're already working on. So that's another part of where people are doing right now. And, and then if you take a look at closely of where they're placing all these technologies, um, a lot of them, I think 60% of them, um, are going towards a public cloud, right? And among those ones, um, almost half of them were doing, um, thinking about going hybrid or multi-cloud. Well, so so I was I was curious, and then I tried to dig up and try to figure out why is this trend, right? So, of course, um, there's a geolocation problems um, because. Uh, there's a trend. Well, there's a there's an observation observation I see where people tend to deploy deploy their applications or their services close to where their business is. Um, if they have their um, their branches in certain areas, they tend to like to have their data centers or the regions where they deploy in the cloud closer to that region, um, close to that place. And also they want to, sometimes they just ex want to expand to another geolocations. So therefore they will set up another service in that location as well. So they, therefore you would have multiple clouds or multiple um, um, clusters of um, data centers or places where you have to manage them together. And another problem why I'm seeing people would have multiple um, cloud or this uh, going towards the separate clusters is uh, when it comes to securities and compliances. And um, because like in different countries, um, different worlds, surprisingly, uh, not all of them use the same um, laws, right? So they will have different regulations and you don't want to deploy every single country's regulations in another country or in your headquarters. It becomes very complex. And it, it becomes very cumbersome when it comes to maintaining, right? So you want to make sure, sometimes people want to make sure that the the, um, the code stays where it is. Um, that's why you would sometimes see that being deployed in a separate cluster, separate cloud. Um, another one that I see is data gravity. I think this is probably why the most, um, the like the most heaviest, like the, um, the most reason why people tend to have multi multiple clusters or multiple cloud scenarios is because data gravity. Um, data tends to stay closer to where they were used. Say if you're heavily, uh, if your most uh, business is, if your business is doing most of their business in, say, Indonesia, 
then most of your data will be in Indonesia, of course. And it doesn't make sense if you have a data center serving them from North America, right? If you're doing things in India, then there's no there's no point of putting your well, putting your clusters in uh, South America, right? It doesn't make, make sense. So it um, so and then because of that, um, and then also because you don't want to spend a lot of um, money on ingress and egress traffic because um, if you're trying to move these amount of data because you know where they are the, where, where where things happens there's a lot of there's a lot of data you don't want to move all of them to different places so um, so that's why they tend to stay in a in a group and in a cluster of data centers right and then another 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 um, reasons why people are moving to different clouds is because, uh, well, I mean, of course, you want to make sure your cloud scenarios, your strategies are resilient. Um, so having that ability to be more agile, moving from one cloud to the other makes your makes it safer. So if uh, Amazon says, uh, I remember like a couple of years ago, uh, their entire region goes down, you still have a contingency plan where you can deploy that on Azure or Google, just making sure that everything stays um, is 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 uh, there's no zero downtime. So there's zero downtimes and everything like that, right? And sometimes um, the, another reason is because they simply have better offering in certain type of technologies. They um, uh, say Google is really good with AI ML, right? And sometimes their machine learning uh, technology is a lot better than the Amazon. So you want to use the one in Google, but the data centers your company were using is is AWS is Amazon. So how are you going to get all these two together? You still have to use the one that's uh, offered by Google, but you still want to get all the data together. So there's a, so then you come, then you would have um, two separate clusters and then you want to have the flexibility. Another reason why is you want to have the flexibility of um, um, bargaining powers. Um, so, and exit strategies. So when there's a vendor, when if if uh, they have a problem, so they tend they uh, cannot provide you with any more services, you still have that ability to move on to another place quickly. But that's why people are thinking about moving to the multi-cloud world, where people, where you you have all these um, services uh, uh, being very agile. But with that, with that flexibilities and agilities, it comes with complexity, right? Um, so the biggest problems, there's, I, I, I think there's three main problems of how, why people are uh, avoiding or try not to be uh, multi-cloud. Well, the first one is uh, from the management side. It's really hard to find people that can master the, uh, the proprietary scale of each cloud, right? It's really hard to find a person that understand Google Amazon and uh, Azure at the same time, right? So being able to find that skillful person to manage three clouds is difficult, right? And then you also have security because your data no longer hides behind the big firewall. It's not protected anymore. It's on the cloud. People, you so you have to make sure that the access of this data are secured um, only and only the essential data are shared across um, to different vendors or to your to another clusters or another cloud that you have deployed. Um, so that's another concern that stops people from moving to multiple clouds. And the other one is connectivities and integration. And that is the one that we will be targeting today. So um, having that, so first of all, if you're thinking about multiple clouds, the biggest problem would be getting the data synchronized, right? So when you have data um, constantly updating in North America, how do you make sure that all these data are synced across the pond to uh, to your uh, your European counterpart, right? So how do you make sure that they all synchronized uh, without sacrificing the need of um, spending a lot of money through uh, to do to do traffic loading, right? APIs are very slow, so I'm surprising these. So, and um, so you have to f figure out a way to quickly transfer and to quickly uh, break the boundaries between the clouds to so the application users doesn't see that boundary. They will be freely to use whatever they want to and quickly connecting to the services they want to have, right? So that will be the challenge and that will be something that we'll be uh, looking at today. And if you look at look, if you look closely into the integration and connectivities, you'll see 
there's um, some problems. Um, the first one is service silo. Um, that's because, like what I said, servers are de mostly deployed close to where their workloads are, right? So you would, you would end up with a lot of services only deployed to a certain cluster or a certain cloud that is serving that particular set of customers. But when it comes to um, developing another service in another region, it's sometimes it's really hard for them to find out what is also available in another places. So then you have this service silo where they don't talk to each other. It's really hard to um, replicate them or you have to duplicate the code and deploy it in the different places and then maintain them separately. That becomes a really bad issue and it costs a lot of money for maintenance, right? And then the other one is data integrity, like, like what I said before, how do I make sure all the critical data are in sync? I'm not talking about those small detailed data because you can take care of them later, later on, but what about the critical ones? Are they being synced um, in real time so that you get um, the information right away? And what about these prepackaged um, services that you purchase, such as Salesforce, such as ServiceNow, or whatever that you purchase on um, the package software, the SaaS services you purchase, how do you get the data out of it? How do you provide data into it? So that's another problem. And then you have also have the point-to-point -point connectivity problem. So this problem would very much um, appear when you have too much too many API calls, right? Because API calls are point to point. And when you're trying to connect to them, you, uh, when you have too many of them were um, connecting together, they become another spaghetti, right? So how do you know if, if I close off this API endpoint that would not cause series of problems on the other departments, right? So that becomes a very messy idea. Well, in the perfect world, everything is gonna be perfect, right? So we have everything um, in a synchronized, uh, in a uh, in a consolidated uh, vision where you can see everything in a single plane of glass, where you can unify, deploy everything into multiple clouds, and these applications are so easy and uh, flexible to and to port it to another cloud, and they are all visible among each other, so you can reuse them, and calling them is not a problem. Data will automatically sync to another world. Um, and then because they're all talking in the same protocol, they're all talking in the same languages, they're all talking in the same format, um, the developer just needs to um, connect to that place and they'll be able to get it. That's the perfect world, but th that's not what it's going to be like in the real world. That we all know this, we've, we, we've, um, we, are, we live in the real world, we know, we know what's going on, right? So you would have a department, they decided to um, purchase Azure because their manager loves Azure. And they just purchased this uh, a really nice platform where they have deployed everything on Azure. But then you have another department where they would say, hey, I just got this really cool um, application from, uh, I just got this uh, really cool sales ordering functionalities and process set up in Salesforce. So let's get all this um, connected together. And the other department says, hey, we want your data from what you have just created. And I want them to be analyzed in Google and then shift that to Amazon for storages, right? So that's something that could happen. And you would end up with a very complex connectivities. And then we sometimes we would also have that legacy systems that you still need to talk to. And that becomes a very complex and spaghetti situations. And that's not really good. And then you also have APIs, right? Then you have also API calls and contract here, contract there. I cannot break the contract. Therefore, um, and then the, the calls, there's different versions. I need to update the API versions all the time. So my solution for that is to create the event mesh. So um, data are not connect from one point to the other. In fact, they are created in a grid mesh like where everything was connected um, and this mesh would grow or some mesh would um, shrink and some part of the mesh would turn off when it's not in use so that was the inspiration of serverless right and then um, all this information are um, transmit and then comes back in the form of events so everything gets notified as events rather than a, a, a very slow synchronized call. Everything gets pushed into a, um, a uh, single unified 
platform where everything go, comes in and out gets monitored and managed by this platform. So you get to see what's coming up, what's going on, and therefore it's uh, easier for you to um, get the data flow between each other. So building that mesh is what we can do with Camel K and streaming services. So in this mesh, what we can do is we can, uh, so many of the talks in different protocols, right? So in this mesh, we will be helping um, these components and entities to quickly uh, transform the, to translate the protocol into something they understand and then connecting to um, to the external components. And the other one is everything is done in real time streams. So you know how Kafka can handle large load of um, events or um, streams of data. This is how we're gonna handle it. So all this information just keeps coming in where uh, I would have my Kafka deployed as the platform where it keeps accepting all these events and then gets processed later. And then these information. So we want to make sure that we saved on ingress and egress traffics. So we talk, we want to make sure that only the important events comes in and comes out. So they get filtered, they get aggregated, they get split depending on your needs, right? So that's something that we need to do in this mesh and it has to be done for you in this platform as well. And then also sometimes the format of the data can be a little bit different. Say the, the data from Salesforce only accepts uh, Salesforce format. So therefore I need to translate whatever was in my database or in my S3 bucket on top of AWS and transfer, transform that into something that um, my Salesforce services understand, right? And this um, entire platform would do the monitoring for me. So I can, I can see what's going on with my events and my mesh. And part of the, this is the part where I'm saying, um, if we can make some of these applications or, or we can do this in a serverless way, if it's if there's no events coming in, we can always turn it off to save some money, right? So this then this part of the grid would, would um, automatically shut down and then um, comes back up again after um, after it's been, um, after it's been uh, not been used, right? And after it's been used. And then we also have discovery. So discovery is something that um, is, I think it's it's going to break the silo. So for um, in each one of the uh, in uh, so in my platform, I would build a series of uh, discover discoverable uh, Google interface where they can see. So this is similar to API interface where you can see what are the contracts. But instead, I'm going to show you what kind of events where I'm going to handle. So this is kind of what I meant by building the event mesh with um, streams and camel. So if you take closer look into the actual um, the actual format of the uh, of the mesh, you will see I have uh, these are topics for um, so these white buckets are the um, the topics of uh, of each on the streams. So in each topics, I would define a event that I want to that I want to uh, receive. Say this one is a sales order event. This one is a, a product order event, and this one is an employment event. Right. So these are all different events, and um, so the, so what I'm seeing are just a bunch of events instead of contracts. Right. And then I would have um, Camel become the becoming the connector. So anybody that wants to talk to my or wants to um, wants to talk to my uh, or save into send events into this will have to go through Camel and Camel will become that interpreter or becoming that connector or fetch uh, the person that fetches or the components that fetch the data from external services into the events. Right, and then they can they can do the 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 uh, the, the apology, the apology uh, transform. They can do the data transform. They can do the orchestration. They can go to several different places and then um, just uh, gathering that to place that into this event bus. So what I'm seeing in my entire system are just uh, just events. So and then they can talk to each other, right? And then um, so here you would have Microsoft. So these these camel here can be either um, a microservices, can be a function. So if they are functions, they become serverless. So if nothing's coming into this uh, into this event, this application or this functions will automatically shut down. And then, um, and then once uh, this information comes in, it will come back up again, 
right? And the the good idea, what I think it's a good idea, is because you can always plug in and then remove it when you don't need it. So say if you don't, if you no longer wants to connect to Salesforce, just remove that plug off, and therefore you're no longer accepting any events from Salesforce. So you have a good idea of where you're coming in and where you're sending it to. So it's a better organized way for your events. And when it, so you don't have to plug in here and there and all your actual services that's listening, actually doing stuff for your events, doesn't have to do that transformation and interpretation of the, of whatever information that comes in. So everything's taken care of. Um, all the events are uniformed, are unified, and they can, um, so when you think about uh, domain driven designs, you have um, these of domain object, right? So how you can map these domain object to your events and then see how events will change your domain object or how you're going to interact your domain object to these events, right? So you can do that. So these events become meaningful instead of just an event or just a request call, right? So that's what I'm seeing, why this event mesh is a better way of, um, of communicating externally, right? And um, I don't know how much time I have. I only have five minutes, um, but this is my demo. Uh, probably I'm not going to show demo today. I have a video on YouTube. You can always go up and watch there. So the the idea was to show that the uh, the camel can connect to uh, to all these uh, different uh, cloud services, and then I also have and then I also have a response back to uh, to the uh, what is it the uh, the Telegram. But I want to show you this. Um, so let me skip that. I only have like five minutes left, sorry. Um, so what I did there in my demo was I was using a couple of things. I was using uh, Kafka Streams and I was using Camel and Camel Quarkus to build microservices. And I was using Camel and Camel K to build functions. So these become serverless. And I also have a event source that's called Camelot that goes out and then grab information from external services. Right. Um, so these are the code. Let me share my entire screen. You see, so this is the code. You see my screen? Yeah. All right. So this is the code that I have and I, everything is in my GitHub repository. So, um, so, so here, here is the structure of the code. I want to go through that with you while I'm here. Um, but so if you go into the code, you'll see there's a, um, AWS, there's an Azure, and there is a, um, a service now. So the most important one is probably the service now. And this is a Camel Quarkus application. So this one is a microservices. This one is not even a, um, this is not even a, uh, a serverless one. But what this does is it does, it goes off and then go to service now and then grab um, all the, the service now tickets from, and then send it to my internal um, streaming. So I have an events called service now ticket. So that service now tickets gets then sent to multiple places. And these gets uh, sent, uh, say for instance, this one in Azure, I'm also sending it as a, um, as a microservices and it gets sent into Azure event bus. But the listener, because I'm not always getting information into my, uh, into my system. So therefore I'm writing this one from Camel K. And this Camel K is very simple where I only have a reader where it reads, um, where it reads from uh, different, so this is my, probably not a good one, probably use the Google one. Yeah, just reads from the Google place, uh, Google pops up. So it's similar to what um, Azure has offered and then just place it into my uh, into my Kafka or into my streams topics where it, it's, uh, it's receiving events, um, successful or failure events if my information has um, sent to Google and then sending it back to me. So this is kind of a, a this is a serverless application that I wrote and it automatically becomes that um, it automatically becomes serverless. So it will scale down to zero and scale up. So in my video, I would, I would, I would show you how it's done and it will, uh, you can see it uh, in action. So I only have five more minutes. Um, so I want to add, I want to um, see if there's any questions. Um, uh, you don't need to worry about time since uh, there are no other talks scheduled after yours. So please take your time. Oh, okay. In that case, um, do I have more? 
Okay, cool. So there's no questions. Let me go back. And then why don't, why don't I just play that clip then? Let me. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. So this one is um, the one I did for. So this one is showing you how I created a, um, a ticket in ServiceNow, where I would uh, create a ticket that sends information into Google. And this is me just typing information in the ServiceNow. And once the information gets entered, um, the, the, the information gets picked up by my uh, service now, um, microservices. And then you can see that information then goes um, to my uh, Telegram, where Telegram says, yes, um, the information get picked up by Google. So if that's go, then this is where I go to the Google Cloud, where it goes and show you the information has gone into the Google topic where you can see there's a spike and let's go to the um, functions. So this functions of on the Google is the service functions. It's listening for any events coming from the topic that I sent. You can see that there's one and it has been executed. And let's take, it, take a look at the log and you can see the information has actually gone into Google Cloud. And then, um, and then you can see that the information has gone in. And so how I did it was, I first of all, my first uh, application was written in Camel Quarkus, and that goes up to ServiceNow. And then the second one gets picked up and then sent to Google. And then Google, there's another listener that listens from events happening from Google and gets sent into service. And um, this then picked up by uh, another serverless applications and then sent to my uh, Telegram. So that's how it's done with Google and the same to the rest of the um, of my applications. So that was how it's done. And let me stop sharing. And the, the rest of, you can watch the rest of them from, um, from my YouTube video. So I am going to uh, place the uh, link to my GitHub repository in the chat. So people in the chat can uh, have access to all the code. And uh, please have uh, me. Okay, so if you have any more questions, um, just let me know. But let, let me close it off by showing off. Yeah, let me share my video, okay. Yeah, I should have like bookmarked it, right? <laughs> Hold on, let me uh, find it first. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, you're on mute. Okay. Okay, we can. Yeah. So, um, can you hear me now? Yep. Hello. Yep. Okay. Cool. Sorry. Yeah. So oh, sorry. Um. So I just pasted the uh the YouTube channel right there. Um. So if you have any more questions or anything, please let me know. But um, I want to quickly share with you about uh, me just. Oh, the wrong tab. So this is the, uh, the, the this is the things I want you to uh, take away with you. Um, so what I did was I was using um, Camel, so Camel was the one that, that I was using. So what I did was I did a lot of uh, um, EIP, so enterprise integration patterns. So what I did was when I got information from um, ServiceNow, I was doing some splitting so that because they all came in a, a big package of with, um, with everything that happened in ServiceNow. So I have to split it into smaller um, to-do list in order to send to different places, right? Because some of them could be uh, sending it to Google, some of them could be to AWS, so I need to do splitting. And once I've done that, I have to, um, because all the information that um, different clouds has, has to be in different format, so therefore I need to do some kind of um, mapping. So therefore I have a, um, I have done some mapping right here. So I was using LS map, which is a drag drop tooling that I can do a drag dropping um, to map the format. And another one I was using that I want to point out was the um, the the 
connectivity to Kafka. So for Camel to connect to Kafka, it was quite easy. What I did was just say, say hey, I want to connect to Kafka. And this is the, uh, the the topic name where it's getting all the incident, the service now incidents. And that was, and then just giving them the broker information. And that was kind of it. That was what I had to do. And to connect to ServiceNow, there is also a ServiceNow component where I can tell them, hey, this is where my ServiceNow instance is. Please go ahead and then create my ServiceNow instance. And that's kind of what I did. And another one that I was using was CamelK. I'm pretty sure you have heard a lot about CamelK. So that's why I didn't want to like dive into what is CamelK. And there is a bunch of video on my channel that tells you what is CamelK. So if you have if you have no idea what CamelK is, please go and watch the video. But basically what CamelK does, it helps you to quickly convert your applications, automatically turns that into serverless. If you have serverless installed on your Kubernetes environment, it automatically just turns everything to serverless. So you don't even have to do anything. It just does, it just does that for you. So what, what I did was I quickly wrote a function like camel route, and it just automatically turns that into a service function for me. And another one that's with uh, worthwhile is the event source connector, which they, they now call it Camlet. Um, so basically you have a, a marketplace of connectors where you don't have to do any coding. You just um, tell, you just do some kind of, you just do declarative um, connectivities where you automatically just fill in where you want to go when where um, the credentials, it's going to automatically fetch the data of your configurations. So that's basically what I did with my demo. And uh, what I want you to take away with you are just the basic idea of how Camel can help you with connectivities. But I think the most important part is the part where I talk about event mesh. I think you should start thinking about how you're going to architect your system. Think, of, think about it differently than just creating APIs and contract. Think about uh, when you are designing your DDD, your um, domain-driven design, think about events. Think of them as one of the bigger entities when you're designing it. And rather than just restful calls, but think about how you're going to use the events to um, trigger or to um, communicate between in between your domains as well. So um, I think that's it for now. Um, thank you very much. And I wish you enjoy uh, this session. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Christina. That was uh, great. And if anybody has any questions, uh, please post them uh, in chat. And have you uh, posted your slides uh, and links in the shed.com profile? Oh, I have not. I'll do it right now. Awesome. I'll do it now. Uh, that would be <laughs> awesome. And the recordings will be made available later. OK, cool. So that's the link to my slide, um, if anybody wants it um, just right now. But I'll put it in the, I'll put it also in the profile as well. Awesome. Thank yep. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for hosting it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all for coming.